I want to work, I want to work through this text with you guys. Um, this is, this is Jesus' final words to us, um, or Jesus' final words to his, to his public audience, right? We've been talking about Palm Sunday, the day, the day that Jesus rides in on the most unimpressive animal on the face of the earth, uh, otherwise known as a donkey, and he, um, he is welcomed with much uh, jubilance and much celebration. Um, he is presenting himself as a king in ways that people don't expect a king to come. And as a result, unbelief begins to surface, unbelief begins to rise. People begin to say, I don't know about this guy. Some people are saying, I don't know about him. Other people are saying, well, I believe he is exactly who he says he is. He's done many mighty works. I'm just not sure if I'm ready to, um, to lose the glory of man, is what the scripture says. Because they love the glory of man more than they love the glory of God. So they believe, but they didn't believe enough to forsake man's opinions, man's thoughts, man's approval. And so there's a lot of unbelief surfacing around this moment. And so Jesus returns back into this scene, and he speaks basically John's recorded final words of his public ministry before he, before he turns it back inward and just spends the rest of his remaining time uh, with his disciples, all right? And so when you think about it, there's a, lot, there, there's a lot that can be said, but normally we say things, we always talk about this, we say things that are important when there's nothing, when we have no more to be said, right? When we're getting down to our last minutes, um, of speaking, our last words, we normally, ref we normally hold those times for very important statements. And this is an important statement that Jesus is making. This is a, this is a statement that summarizes basically everything that he has, um, he has been communicating up to this point in his three-year ministry. It's the idea that, that regardless of what you've seen throughout these three years, regardless of what you've heard throughout these three years, there's one thing that you need to take away from it, and it is this. That the Father has been with me every step of the way. Amen. That I have not stepped outside of him in terms of speech. That I have not stepped outside of him in terms of deed and activity. That I have ne not stepped, out stepped outside of him in terms of will and desire. Everything I've done has been approved and authorized by God. And he has ratified that on several occasions, speaking from the clouds and saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is, what I, this is my beloved son. Do what he says. Right? And so, and so he speaks that in order for us to know, instead of us walking away, when Jesus says, says hard things, in order, instead of us walking away and saying, well, that's a really hard teaching, that's just probably crazy Jesus kind of getting off the rails there. But, but, but God the Father comes down from heaven and says, no, 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 no. What he says, what he does, how he acts, I've approved it. And that's going to be helpful for us as we get to some hard things in the, in the, in the long run here shortly. All right. But it begins by saying that Jesus cried. He cried out. He spoke with a loud voice and cried out and yelled amongst the crowds and said, whoever believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me, verse 44. And whoever sees me sees him who sent me. And so Jesus is very much connecting himself, um, unifying himself in every way possible to the Father in heaven. He says, if you believe me, then you believe the Father. If you don't believe me, you don't believe the Father. You can't go outside of me in order, and, and say that you believe the Father. In order to believe the Father, you must believe me. That's important for our understanding of how religion plays out in the world, Right? Because there's oftentimes the, the sentiment, particular, particularly in this postmodern age where your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and your truth over here is your truth, there's the sentiment where, hey, we'll all get there. We'll all get to heaven. You just keep worshiping the, worshiping the God that you worship and I'll keep worshiping the God that I worship and eventually we'll just cross worlds. But Jesus is saying that in order to worship that quote-unquote God, that God is seen in me. Amen. That you can't go outside of me to get to him. I am one with him. We see that established very early in, in the book of John. From the very beginning, chapter 1, when we read verse 1 through 3, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And so the Word was the very self-expression of God. And that word was one with God. That word was God, in fact. 
And then it goes on and it says that the word, verse 14, as you skip down in that chapter, it says that that very word became flesh and it dwelt among us and, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth, coming forth from the father, the son, full of grace, full of truth, was the word made flesh. He was the word that was with God. He was the word that was God. And so everything that God expresses from himself is seen clearly, audibly, and visibly in the Son. You can't go beyond him in order to get to the Father in heaven. So Jesus says that if you believe me, you have, or, or, or in order to believe God, or, or rather if you believe in me, then you believe not in me, but you believe in him who sent me. And then he says, if you have or if you see me, you see him who sent me. There was a moment, or there's coming a moment, in fact, in a few chapters as Jesus breaks away and begins to spend exclusive time with his disciples. There's going to be a moment where one of his disciples is going to ask a question. That disciple's name is Philip. He's going to say, Lord, show us the Father and it'll be enough for us. He's going to say that in John chapter 14, in fact, two chapters down the road. But Jesus is going to say back to him, in verse 9 of that chapter, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak to my, on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And so Jesus says this in response to Philip. When Philip says, show us the Father and we'll believe. It'll be enough if you show us him. Philip says, you apparently don't know me. There's, there's great significance in that kind of statement. In, in, in other words, in order to treat Jesus as this side character in the divine story is to not know Jesus. In order to set him aside and say, well, he did a lot of great things, but, I mean, it, if you guys want to follow him, go ahead and follow him. We're going to follow this other guy because that's who we believe in. It's not to know Jesus at all. In order to know Jesus, you must, in fact, know that he and the Father are, in fact, one. And that when you see Jesus, you see, you see the divine God. He is the embodiment of God the Father. He is fleshed out. Everything that God the Father desires to speak to you, he has spoken through his son. Jesus says, if you have seen me, then you have seen him. And in order, whoever believes in me believes not simply in me, but in him who sent me. And then he says in verse 46, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. When Jesus entered into the world, he brought an eternal and sustaining light with him. In John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Jesus is that light shining in the darkness. Here's an interesting thing is it says that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Remain in darkness. That would indicate that apart from him, we're in darkness. That before him, we was in darkness. That there was no moment of enlightenment. Darkness is not a condition we turn to or move into. It is a condition that we begin from because of our distance from God. It is a condition that we begin in because we were, we were shaped in iniquity, formed in sin. No matter how badly we would like to portray ourselves as being in light, no matter how badly we would like to portray ourselves as being enlightened, no matter how badly we would like to portray ourselves as being illuminated or being quote-unquote woke, apart from Christ, our condition remains one of immense darkness. In fact, in the third chapter of John, he communicates, John does, communicates what remaining in darkness actually looks like versus a commitment to step into the light of Christ. He says in chapter 3 this, 
Verse 19, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Abiding in the darkness is a commitment to our own way. Abiding in the darkness is a commitment to our own doings, our own works. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life and wealth and possessions, bigotry, sexual immorality, lust, pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, selfishness, envy, jealousy, and the foundation of them all is unbelief. Belief in oneself more than belief in God. It is a commitment to the belief in oneself. Versus God. It doesn't desire to be delivered because if it does actually find deliverance, it will be exposed in the light and so it hides in the shadows. This is our state before we were awakened by God. Once it steps into the light, the light of Christ will bring exposure. And with that exposure comes conviction and with that conviction comes change. So it continues to remain in the darkness. On the other hand, stepping into the light is described. Um, it, it's, it's described in such a way where we find that it is genuine trust in Christ because, or rather genuine trust in Christ's perfect work that's demonstrated by a new commitment, a new commitment. Instead of the old commitment to oneself, it's now a new commitment to God. It's a new commitment to Christ. It's a new commitment to the truth that is found in his gospel. Trusting Christ is stepping into the light to be exposed. But it's stepping into the light to be exposed in order that that exposure might bring the necessary conviction that brings the necessary change. It's stepping in the light to be exposed, to be healed. It's stepping in the light to be exposed, to be made whole. Not to operate in your own strength, not to operate in your own power, but to operate in his. He says, he says, but whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. In other words, the works that are good in you aren't works that are done in your own power. They're works that are done through his power. This is what is being said. In John chapter 3, but this is also what's being said in John chapter 12, when he says, I have come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. When the light comes, those who trust in him have the opportunity to step into the light. And when they step into the light, yes, they will be exposed, but they will also be changed and healed and made whole. Are you tracking with that? When we refuse to step into that light, we remain in the darkness. The darkness that we've, all, that we've always been in. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking, apart from Christ, you're in light. You are not. We are not. Light doesn't exist outside of him. It's all a mirage. This whole life is a mirage outside of Christ. It's darkness that is taking on the illusion of light. In fact, this is precisely the point of Jesus' next recorded words in this chapter, 12th chapter. Verse 47, he says, if anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge them, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Now, if you read verse 47 apart from verses 48 and 49, then this seems like a relief for the unbeliever. It can be extremely comforting to hear God say, I did not come to judge the world, but I came to save it. But let's look at, matter of fact, let's look at some other words in, 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 this, in this chapter. For example, just to analyze how comforting this can be for the unbeliever. John chapter 12, verse 24 through 26. Let's just look at verse 26. It says, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Those are Jesus's words. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so Jesus says, in order to be where I am, that person who desires to be where I am must serve me. 
must follow me, must walk with me. And, the, and, and if you hear Jesus later on down the road say, hey, I didn't come to judge the world, I came to save the world, that can be very comforting for the unbeliever because that means, well, I don't really have to listen to what he just said. I, I mean, because he came to save the world, he didn't come to judge it. So I'm going to be saved regardless. As a matter of fact, that's what some people, the position that they take. Jesus is love. God is love. Only God can judge me. How many times have we heard that? Right? And, 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 and typically when that kind of statement is made, it's made as a rebuttal to anyone who would dare challenge my way of life. You don't challenge what I'm doing. I do what I want to do. Only God's going to judge me. And God is love. And God came to save, not judge. And so I'm going to be just all right. Thank you very much. Are you tracking with that? But see, verse 47 doesn't, isn't spoken apart from verses 48 and 49. And verses 48 and 49 mean everything to verse 47. This is what verse 48 and 49 says. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment what to say and what to speak. Jesus' words are not simply meant to be heard as a universal acceptance of everyone and everything. Him saying that I did not come to judge, but I came to save, does not mean that judgment isn't coming. Are you tracking? In fact, in some ways, it means that judgment is already here. And that it is culminating, if you will. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, talks about, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, And so desperate to all men, because all sin, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law, yet death reigned through Adam and Moses, even over those sinning, whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. In other words, sin came into the world and death came with it. That is judgment. Are you tracking with that? Ephesians 2 verse 1 says, you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of God's wrath. That is judgment. It says you were dead in your trespasses apart from Christ." And that you were by nature, apart from Christ, children of God's wrath. That is judgment. Our condition is not neutral, see? See, the idea when Jesus says that I came not to judge but to save, the assumption is is that we are in a neutral condition, but we aren't in a neutral condition. Sin has already corrupted this world and everyone who is in it, including me. Jesus doesn't have to condemn this world because our sin has already brought about the beginning of that condemnation. Do you understand that? The popular passage, John 3, 16, says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it. Listen, to condemn it, all right? So there we hear it again. But in order that the world might be saved through him. Now listen, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. And so no, he did not come to judge because judgment has already begun. He did not come to condemn, not because there will be no condemnation, but because condemnation has already begun. Whoever does not believe is condemned already, continuing in chapter 3, because he has not believed in the name of the Son, the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil, as we read earlier. 
Listen, folks, Jesus is coming to save a condemned people, not to condemn a safe people. He's not coming to condemn, but it's not because we're safe. He's not coming to condemn because the condemnation has already begun. He has come to rescue us from the condemnation. Absent of a rescuer, we will suffer the punishment of eternal condemnation. Absent of a redemptive savior, you will, I will suffer eternal condemnation. Colossians 3, chapter 5 tells us, on, on chapter, I'm sorry, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then it goes on listing all sorts of sins, sexual immorality, impu impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetedness, which is idolatry. It says, on account of these, the wrath of God is coming. The wrath of God is coming. We are not safe. Condemnation has begun and it's coming. This brings up another good point. When you look at verse 49, it says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say and what to speak. So there's unity, again, that we see in Jesus with his Father. He isn't presenting some off-the-cuff guidance that's outside of the Godhead. The eternal life that he offers and the eternal condemnation that he speaks of are not in opposition to God the Father's will. They are God the Father's will. It is essential that we understand this in this day and age because we want to we take, take the fire off the message. And, and listen, man, Lord knows I want to take the fire off the message. There ain't a bigger people pleaser in this room than me. I want it to be nice and cuddly. I want everybody to come in, come in, let's get a big hug, you know? I'm not the guy that wants to spit this kind of fire from the pulpit. <laughs> but it's the message. And loving you is not hiding the message, that's despising you. Loving you is reeling you in with tears and weeping as we talk through the message. And I say, please come to the Lord and be saved. Please come to Jesus for the remission of your sin. No one talked about hell more than Jesus. And now we see that it was the Father that literally told him what to speak and how to speak it. And so we know that God, the Father in heaven, authorized every statement that was made, warning us of the wrath to come. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Jesus said, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother and will be liable to judgment, whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell, to the hell of fire. Verse 29 of chapter 5 in Matthew says, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will, be revealed, that will not be revealed or hidden, that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear, whisper, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus tells the disciples in Matthew chapter 23, you serpents, verse 33, you serpents, you brood of vipers, how are you to escape being sentenced to hell? Jesus tells a parable about people getting invited to a wedding. Some people come, some people don't. Sounds like a good parable, right? Yeah, kind of until he ends it and says, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Wait a second, Jesus. How do we get the weeping and gnashing of teeth? I thought we were talking about a wedding. Nobody talks about hell more than Jesus. And the Father is authorizing not only what to say, but how to say it. I 
I'm not trying to kill our vibe this morning, right? I'm not. I'm not. We sung great songs. You know, we're feeling real good, had, had a couple of laughs. I'm not trying to kill our vibe, but it is the truth about God. Now, he, now here's the beauty in this, right? Here's the beauty in this. I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to give you this to, to, literally, to literally cause you to run in dread from God. I'm trying to give you this in order that the gospel message comes, becomes even more precious to you in order that the sacrifice that Jesus made becomes even more precious to you. Part of the reason why the sacrifice of Jesus means so little to so many is because they don't understand what it, uh, what it rescues them from. Because nobody's talking about it. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, we come in church and there are literally litanies of verse written for us, warning us of the wrath of God. And no one ever tells us that it's coming. We just get a couple of tips about good marriage and a couple of pointers about good parenting and a couple of things to say, hey, yeah, I know you guys are having some tough times on your jobs. And, and all of that is fantastic. But you know what? You know, you know what, you know, you know what will really be serious? Hell. And you know what you won't be thinking about if you go there? Your job. You won't be thinking about it. And so it has to be said. It has to be communicated. Does that make sense? And I want to talk about our jobs. We'll talk about our jobs too. And some, I'm sure we'll throw some application in there. Let me say this though, there is hope, right? And the reason why the hope is so good is because we understand the condemnation is so bad. Jesus says that I have not come to judge the world. The world is already being judged. Condemnation has already begun. But I have come to save the world. And hallelujah, isn't that good news? That regardless of how, how miserable this picture is that we've painted, that none of us have to ever experience it. No matter how devastating hell can actually be, none of us have to ever taste it. He says, I came to save the world. And then he says in verse 50, he says, and I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say the Father, I say as the Father has told me. So not only has the Father spoken to him about condemnation or, or shared with him about judgment to come, and not only when you look at him, you see the Father, and not only when you believe in him, you are believing in the Father, but also the commandment about eternal life has come from God, the Father, and so it too is ratified. In other words, the entire, entire ministry of Jesus Christ, from the judgment to the life that's offered eternally, all of it has been ratified by God the Father. He has stamped it with his approval. And so there is eternal life to come, but it comes through the commandment. You say, what's the commandment? Well, I believe the commandment is what Jesus has, Jesus began with and what John ends with. When Jesus enters into his gospel ministry, he steps onto the scene. And in chapter four of Matthew, we hear these words, from the time that Jesus began to preach. In other words, from the moment that he kicked off and all the way through, we heard these words, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn from worship of self. Turn from trusting in self. Turn from trusting in false idols. Turn from pouring your, your water into cisterns that can hold no water, broken cisterns. And turn to the God who offers life Turn to the Son, the Savior of the world who perished for you, who sacrificed for you, who laid his, life on, laid his life down, put it on the line for you. Repent means to turn, but it doesn't simply mean to turn away. It means to turn to. 
Sometimes our gospel is empty in that sense because all we're doing is poking at people's sin and telling people to turn from sin and turn from sin and turn from sin. And we act like that there really is nothing significant about God except for the fact that we don't get to, we don't get to go to hell if we come to him. But there's so much more about God to turn to. When we paint big pictures about him and show him in all of his majesty and all of his glory and all of his beauty, then it becomes obvious that I should turn, right? Not because I'm worried about hell, but because he's so much better than what I have. So repentance is not just a turning away, but it is a turning to. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is here. The kingdom of God has begun or began. When the men and women gathered in the book of Acts, where the church is first established, book of Acts chapter 2, when it is first getting launched and the Spirit comes down in power, the Holy Spirit of God comes down in power, and men and women gather, begin to speak in other languages, testifying of the glory of God. And people begin to say, man, wait a second. I'm pretty sure that guy's an African, but he's talking Wakanda." Maybe some of of y'all saw that. Maybe you didn't. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that guy's an Asian, but I think I hear Japanese. So this picture of God's power is on display, right? And I'm giving you guys some modern-day examples. There's a lot of other nations involved in that, but I'm giving you some modern-day examples to pull from. But nevertheless, they're talking in other languages that people recognize, And then they say, what does this mean? Are these guys drunk? And Peter steps up and he says, no, no, no. This is not drunkenness that you see. This is God moving in power, establishing his church. And he preaches the gospel. And they say, what shall we do, right? What command shall we follow? And Peter says, repent and be baptized, which is a demonstration of trust and belief and faith. Repent and believe. And so when Jesus says the commandment that gives eternal life has been authorized by the Father, what he's talking about is the commandment of repentance and faith, trusting and believing, turning from our way, turning to his way. In that, we are rescued. Amen? In that, we come out of the darkness and we come into light. In that, we find that the truth of God's word in Romans, where it says, there is now therefore no condemnation, in that we find that it now applies to us. That though this world is being condemned based on its sin, that those that are in Christ Jesus, Paul says, there is no condemnation to come for you. And you're going to say, well, hey, man, I'm not perfect, so I know I'm going to probably fall sometimes in this. Got it. Got it. That's not the point. Because this Savior that died for you, he's sufficient to carry your sin. He's sufficient to bear it. Matter of fact, he did. When he went to the cross, he bore your sin, past, present, and future. Every single sin of the saints throughout history were hung on his back on that day. And so now you can turn to the beauty. You can turn away from your old life and turn to the beauty that is found in him. And you can walk full of joy, full of goodness, full of happiness, full of, full of delight in him and what he has done for you. But you must turn. And that's why he leaves them with these words, because there's an unbelieving crowd that refuses to embrace him. And so he's saying, you can go on your way if you want to, but understand that if you continue down this road, that you will not be with me when the dust settles. In order to be with me, you must turn to me. Amen. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, we are ever so grateful and thankful for you. We're thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and the blood that he spilled for the remission of our sin. We're thankful, Lord God, that though this world is being condemned, been condemned and being condemned, 
though hell is real and horrendous, that, Father, you have not left us without an escape, that you sent your son into this world, that he walked perfectly with you, obeyed you in every way. He spoke your words. And Father, he spoke not only your words of judgment to come, but Lord God, he spoke your words of eternal life to come. And so Lord, I pray that every single heart in this room would be leaned towards trusting you as Lord and as Savior. There, there be any in this room who are holding back and saying, well, I got this and I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it because I feel like that's more fun or I feel like that's going to, at the end, going to give me more benefit. I pray, Lord God, that conviction would come, that exposure from your light would come, and that that conviction, Lord God, would bring recognition of our sin, but also would highlight the beauty and the glories of Christ and bring about change, transformation, salvation. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.